Hello and welcome to another episode of The Gayest Generation, where we hear LGBTQ older adults speak for themselves. Each episode, we sit down with a different member of the LGBTQ community who laid the foundation for the freedoms we have today. In this episode, we speak with Roger Lelever. Now, Roger has lived a thousand lives. Ann Arbor news reporter, longtime DJ at the Nectarine Ballroom, Lake Superior freight ship sailor. We get an inside look at the height of queer nightlife in Ann Arbor, the unique challenge of interviewing Yoko Ono and almost killing Sylvester. This is The Gayest Generation. Hi, my name is Roger Lelever. I am 69 years old. And no jokes. I don't want to hear any jokes about this. <laughs> and do you see it in my face? I do. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm, I'm a, a cis man who lives in Ann Arbor part-time and up in the Upper Peninsula uh, rather other part of the time. Roger, it's wonderful to meet you, and I'm so glad that we're able to have this conversation today. Me too. Um, let's start at the beginning, as it is a wonderful place to start. Where, you, where were you born? Where are you from? I was born in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and I grew up there. I went to high school there. I went to college there for a year at Lake Superior State, and then uh, I transferred down to Central Michigan University, uh, from from which I graduated in 1977 with a degree in journalism, and uh, a double major in photojournalism and history. Now you might be our first Uper on the podcast. Uh, for those who might not be familiar with what the UP is, can you dress the scene for us a little bit? Uh, the Upper Peninsula is a beautiful piece of land, uh, straight up I-75 and just over the Mackinac Bridge, bordering with Canada, where I grew up, and then to the west, bordering with Lake Superior. It goes all the way over to Wisconsin. It's a very large piece of property. The most beautiful nature things I've ever seen, but being there, uh, I, I feel there's something very different. I'm in a different place. Mm -hmm then uh, it almost feels like a different um, country or state even. It, it kind of is. I, I cross that Mackinac Bridge and I go, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's just so beautiful. I, you know, I don't care how bad the weather is. It's yep. beautiful. And youpers, I feel like y'all could face <laughs> hurricanes, yeah. blizzards. And we wouldn't think a second about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, down here, there's an inch of snow forecast and people buy out the stores. And up there, there's 10 inches of snow forecast and people go, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> I got a friend tonight who doesn't want to come out because it's raining. No. I'm like, oh, get those no. windshield wipers slapping. Snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> um, what kind of kid were you? Uh, I was quiet. Uh, I was kind of a nerd. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the kid that rode my bicycle. Everywhere after dinner, I was very independent. Uh, there was no helicopter parenting like you find now. It's like, <laughs> well, I'll be home before dark. Uh, I developed an interest in the ships on the Great Lakes at a very young age okay. because my grandfather worked on the dock uh, for his, most of his career that put the coal on the ships they burned for fuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a cottage, or they had a cottage, on the St. Mary's River near the Sioux Locks. And I spent all of my summers with them at the cottage growing up on the river, watching the boats go by. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, eventually going out as a hobby, taking pictures of them. Uh, and I, I met a guy up there that published a book about ships mm -hmm. called Know Your Ships, of course. <laughs> and he kind of became my mentor over the years and uh, kind of a surrogate dad because my, my parents were divorced. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, so the whole upshot of that thing is when he passed away in 1994, he left me his book. Wow. And that's what I do now, as I'm the editor and publisher of this annual 200-page guide, field guide to the boats and boat watching on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway. And before we stepped into the recording, you had told me a story about going to your local library. Oh, yeah, sure. It was the Carnegie Public Library, of course. And uh, Mrs. Keegan was the librarian. Mm, and shout I, out to Mrs. Keegan. Uh, yep. And I, you know, she really saw, you know, saw a kid that really loved to read. And I did. My grandmother taught me how to read. And my grandmother had been a teacher, oh, in a one room schoolhouse mm -hmm. back in the 20s and 30s. And she made sure I knew how to read at an early age. So I'd go and I'd take. I'd be able to take out the limit of the books that they allowed. <laughs> and then my grandmother and I would read them both at, you know, at the same time, and then we'd uh -huh. have discussions about them. Uh, really gave me a head start 
in terms of school. Now, I wish she'd have done the same with mathematics. I am not a numbers person. And, <laughs> no, nor know, am I. No, don't ask me to balance your checkbook, buddy, because it's not going to happen. I don't, don't even do mine. And yet I run a business, so yeah. go figure. And math is all definite answers. I'm not interested yeah. in, in definite answers. So. No, close is fine with me. Yeah. Close enough. <laughs> do you have any uh, favorite books from when you were a kid or... Is anything uh, a particular title that sticks out to you when you were reading with your grandma? I was really big in science fiction. Yeah, I read oh. all the Robert Heinlein, Heinlein books, all the mm-hmm. Isaac Asimov books. Also loved the Hardy Boys, of course. And when I ran out of those, I read all the Nancy Drew mm-hmm. books. I believe I found out later in life they were actually written by the same person. That that needs what? that needs fact checking. This but. is like finding out Santa's not real. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's. <laughs> um, oh. And then, uh, how about the Dune books? Dune is huge now. Well, I did not like the Dune books because they did, don't make no sense. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I did not like the first movie, and I found the new movie also equally boring. <laughs> I don't know. The newest movie is so shiny. Yeah. It doesn't. Uh, Dune was more colorful in my well, head. Well, I, I thought maybe the addition of Timothy Chalamet might make a difference. Yeah, however, no, no, not really. Stoic, very stoic. Good. Yes, yeah. yes. Anyways, um, huh. as you're growing up in the UP, which is not the most, well, really Michigan as a whole during that time period and even up until now, you know, it's not the most gayest place in the world. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> How did you come to find out? What gay even was? I went to college. Ah. Tell me about that. Well, uh, so to my knowledge, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sure there were, but to my knowledge, there were no gay people in the UP. Of course. Except, of course, I found out later my high school French teacher. Oh. Of course. I, I ran <laughs> I ran into him in a gay bar in Lansing. Uh, if anybody ever down there remembers Tramps Disco, uh, 1979 mm-hmm. night or whatever, hey, he was dressed in full leather. <laughs> and my my one friend said, look, look over there. Look who that is. And I said, oh, my God. And I walked up and I said, monsieur, ain't you? <laughs> And he, he like, turned white. Yeah. And he ran out the door. No. <laughs> it was, like, terrible. <laughs> it's like you can stay now. The, yeah, the, right. The, yeah, exactly. The mystery's over. Exactly. So, But, yeah, so there was nothing up there, really. I mean, it, you know, I suspected I was – I tried girls, so many girls. Nothing – no interest, nothing. Never worked. No sparks. No sparks at all. And what does that mean when you say you knew you were different? Um, of, of the other boys – yeah talked about girls i was not interested in them but nor did i think that even think at all about boys being an option Mm -hmm. Uh, i didn't think that was possible although i i can tell you what i remember the names of all the cute boys in (laughs) junior high school but i I can't tell you the name of a girl really so so that's kind of kind of crazy Um, when i kind of started to realize that i was gay There was a second where I thought to myself, I am the only person in the whole world who is this. Mm -hmm. And it's very, uh, I don't know how I felt. I was in the fourth grade. I was confused. Mm -hmm. How did did you feel? Did you put it somewhere in your brain? Did you? Long long way in the back, if it did. Yep. I remember uh, a friend of the family telling me I shouldn't carry my textbooks the way I did. Because it was the way a girl carried textbooks. Mm. And I couldn't hang out with this one guy that was my friend because he had long hair. And he was a little feminine, and people would get the wrong idea. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's these rules. Rule. My grandmother, who uh, I, I was very close to, said, "You better get married before you're 30, or people start start you know having ideas about you." And I'm like, "Hmm, don't. <laughs> what does that mean?" Yeah. What ideas? Yeah. Um, why 30? Yeah. What, what's the magic age? Why? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hear you. Yeah, but you come to college though. Come to college in Mount Pleasant, and the world opens up for me. I did not think high school was all that great. I have no hugely fond memories other than being the yearbook nerd. Mm-hmm. I had a, a beautiful dark room that basically served as my locker, my study hall, where I ate my lunch, where I escaped from the whole place. Yes. If, if you shut that door and the red light came on, no one was going to bother you, even if you were just having lunch, right? <sighs> um, 
And it became pretty clear in my senior year to my teachers that I was going to be a photographer and I was going to be going into the newspaper business uh, because I was already writing and doing things for the local paper when I was 18. Uh, so they just they just let me go. Yeah. Like, hey, I, I got to go to do something for the paper. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, it was so much freer than it is now, I'm assuming. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I did go into the newspaper business after a... Uh, an attempt I tried to do a summer. I spent a summer working on a Great Lakes freighter because I thought maybe I'd go do do that. Mm -hmm. go from Sault Ste. Marie, you know, guys th did that. That was yes. a common thing. And you love ships. And I love ships. And it seemed like to you know I got a job on one. And uh, uh, really, it, you know, it wasn't my thing really. Mm -hmm. I, I was too isolated, too uh. you no, know, too boring. And working on a Great Lakes freighter, does that mean you're on the ship itself? Yeah, all in, the time. All the time. I was on the ship from uh, early June till when I went to college in August. Oh. Except you, know, you get off maybe to walk around at a dock in Marquette or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, go up uh, to the bars in Detroit if you got in at a certain hour and you had to wait to unload your car. I worked for the Ford Motor Company ship. Okay. So Ford, the boat came in, unloaded the iron ore to make the cars. So if I didn't have to work like it was after dinner because I was in the galley department, me and my buddy and our boss, the, the chief cook, they'd take us up to the stripper bars on Michigan Avenue, and I learned <laughs> a lot of things I didn't learn in the Upper Peninsula. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so but, so um, you would go from Sault Ste. Marie down to Detroit? Yes. Well, no, I, we loaded our cargo in Marquette okay, for the I most see. part at the iron ore uh, dock up there, and we'd go, come down to Detroit. So we'd go through Sault Ste. Marie, and I'd, I'd wave at my grandmother with a bed sheet. Oh, my gosh. She was going by the house. And, uh, uh, so, yeah, th so those are the days I, I got to college. And at college, uh, uh, you're meeting gay people or... Well, I'm meeting many other people. You meet all and, walks of life. Y y well, and I'd read some books, um, Good Times, Bad Times by James Kirkwood, which had a very strong gay theme. Mm -hmm. uh, Dancer from the Dance by Patricia Nell Warren. Uh, and... I could see these, there were some possibilities I was not aware of, particularly. Those are two titles I have not heard of. I'll be excited to, oh, to, they're, to check them out. They're, they're classic. Patricia Nell Warren, is she Annie on my mind? She might be. She yeah. might be. Um, I can really relate to kind of finding out about the world through books. Mm -hmm. It's a really powerful thing. Yeah, um, absolutely. And... Uh, you're meeting all sorts of walks of life at college. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about Central Michigan and what Mount Pleasant is like so we kind of understand the, the set dressing? M Mount Pleasant lives up to its name, really. Mm -hmm. it, it, hello. It was a, it's a very pleasant place. Uh, coming from the Upper Peninsula, uh, I thought it would be a good kind. It's not as big as Michigan or Michigan State. Mm -hmm. But I was going into journalism, and they were very well known for their program and also for their job placement. Also, it's where my high school friends went. Okay, nice. <laughs> so, you know, now I laugh nowadays because parents spend so much time visiting schools and going through all sorts of rigmarole to figure out what college should go. And I'm like, yeah, my friends went there. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't look at anything else. I just <laughs> went to Central. Uh, it turned out to be a pretty good decision. Yeah. So, uh, so my, my freshman year in college was actually spent at Lake Superior State in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and I uh, took journalism classes there, and I worked at the newspaper, then moved on down to Mount Pleasant and uh, lived in the dorm. Mm -hmm. So, and that was, if you remember the times right there, that was 1974, 75, 76. And things are starting to happen around the country. Articles about gay people are being written about in newspapers and magazines. People are throwing pies at Anita Bryant and boycotting orange juice. For people who don't know who Anita Bryant is, yes. can you fill us in? Yeah, Anita Bryant was a beauty pageant winner uh, in Florida. Uh, uh, you'd, you'd call her now a, a Christian evangelical, I'm sure, uh, and she was afraid that gay people were going to recruit uh, their children, so she formed this group called Save Our Children, and uh, it did not go well for her. <laughs> it did, it, it <laughs> it did, did not, not. go for a while. And what's crazy, she's kind of the um, blueprint for all the it, baloney. For all the crazies to follow, yes. you know, yes. And it kind of, at least to my understanding of, of history, was kind of the first person to publicly be like, we need, to, it, it's a saving our children issue. It is. It is. It's, and, yeah. And she was uh, employed by the Florida 
the orange juice lobby or the orange juice people and she's saying jingles on tv about about florida orange juice so all the gay bars in the country started boycotting florida orange juice and pouring it down the drain and oh, they dropped her yeah <laughs> um and there's also something just inherently really gay about singing orange juice jingles yeah it's like you yeah. hate gay people but you're doing Come something to the florida sunshine tree <laughs> I, I remember that song very well uh. so so the funny thing is that she was testifying or giving a hearing or something and somebody hit her in the face with a pie <laughs> <laughs> and she licked it off she goes well at least it was fruit pie <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or at least it wasn't fruit pie <laughs> but, yes. should have had an orange pie if such a thing it, exists it should have been but I found out, in addition to, of course, the, the books I've been reading and you know the things I'm seeing in the press and around school, there was a group on campus, gay liberation group or whatever, the gay support group, I don't quite remember the name of it, but they were having a meeting in the student union. My dorm was right next to the student union. In fact, I looked right down on it. Yep. Um, and after stealing up my courage, I'm not exactly sure where I found the courage to do it, I went to it. I went to it. Okay, and what is that stepping in that room? Horrible. Yeah. Terror, absolute sheer terror. But the thing was, I did, went to that meeting, I'm like, I'm nothing like these people. Mm -hmm. But remember, I'm a kid from the Upper Peninsula. I like to go out in boats and, you know, what, all the Upper Peninsula guy stuff, you know. I, so, and I'm, I'm not sure I even went back to a meeting, yeah. actually. But I did meet a few people. Uh, and, you know, things kind of went from, from there. I met more people. Uh, uh, I got a job at a, a weekly newspaper, mm -hmm. and my boss was gay. He was one year ahead of me in uh, in school. So he was the editor. I was the photographer and one of the writers. And we would make the trek from Mount Pleasant. Every Thursday night, Was uh, we'd go down to this bar called Tramps Disco. In Lansing? In Lansing. Okay. And next door was another uh, kind of a, a slightly sleazier bar called Joe Cavallo's. And we'd go down there, and, and we'd leave it and drive back to Mount Pleasant. Mm -hmm. He was a morning person, and I wasn't. So <laughs> he'd go to work in the morning and cover for me, and I'd go to work in the afternoon on Friday and cover for him. Uh, but we made that trek a number of times. In fact, even a few times, we, we actually, when I spent a weekend, we'd come down to Ann Arbor and go to this notorious club called the Rubiad. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, and again, now I'm meeting more people. I've discovered Sagatuck. Uh, Many a happy party on the beach in Sagatuck <laughs> in the in the early eighties. Uh, oh. uh, my my roommate in uh, Mount Pleasant, his uncle was gay and lived in Chicago, mm -hmm. so we had to go visit the uncle. He took us to the bars, all the big discos in Chicago. That all that was eye opening. New Year's Eve, nineteen seventy nine. You know, in Chicago, they're playing "I Will Survive" and "We Are Family," except they're new. Yeah. There actually hits at that exact moment. Ah! <laughs> so you have an extensive, or um, how do I phrase this? Uh, you're engaging with nightlife. Yes. At large. Absolutely, yep. Can you tell us a little bit about, in, because we only know gay bars as what we've had, which has now disappeared, or mm -hmm. what little we have now. You described like five or six different places. Can you tell us what it's like to be in there in that moment? Oh, every city had so many, even Detroit had so many bars yeah. at the time. Uh, and spoiled for choice. If yeah. you liked this, you went to that bar. If you liked, if you were a disco person or a dance person, you went to that bar. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted, there were baths. If you wanted to go to the bathhouse, if mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, you, if you, then the country music craze hit. You had a country bar, you know. You had a drag bar. You had a, you know. It was you were just so much to choose from. Uh, I would, I don't even know. I would, I would give my pinky nail for a gay country bar. Oh yeah. Let me go. Hey, go to the go to the hayloft. That's as <laughs> that's right. That's as close as you're gonna get now. <laughs> they better start playing some but, country but, music. But they, but they don't have any line dancing. Yeah, uh, that's exactly it. <laughs> At any rate. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, so um, I was asked to describe recently the, the nightlife in Ann Arbor in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, uh, so 1979, I, I moved here. Here's the funny thing is I stayed with my aunt and uncle for a couple of months mm -hmm. while I got situated. And my uncle said, you can go any place you want in town. He says, but don't go to that Rubiat. 
I was like, uh, well, I was there last night, and I'm <laughs> going to be going there tonight. <laughs> That's actually the tip for yeah. me to go there. Yeah, right, right. And stay away from there. Oh, okay. Oh, I'll be. And I came to Ann Arbor for my job interview, and I was driving around trying to find this place I heard about called The Flame. Yes. And I never did find it on that trip, but I found it when I moved here. And can you tell us, um, so you, you've you come to Ann Arbor for a job interview with... The Ann Arbor News. The Ann Arbor News. Yes. This and was, at this time, uh, can you tell us what the Rubiat was like? It's come up in so many interviews. Oh, well, it was uh, formerly a straight bar mm -hmm. uh, that somehow went gay. Uh, <laughs> as, as kind of happened, you know, there, there was a lot of activity going on in Ann Arbor in 1979 or so about equal rights. And, you know, we, I think uh, the city council passed an ordinance uh, about, you know, it's okay to be gay, whatever. Yep. Uh, you couldn't discriminate against gay people in your in your business, uh, and so gay people kind of took over the Rubiat. Mm. Uh, and at first, the owner was not happy, and then he saw the money rolling in. This yeah. is my personal theory, sure. about, by the way. Uh, he was a very colorful uh, European guy, Greek mm -hmm. guy. I think he was Greek or something like that. Uh, he saw that cash rolling in, and all of a sudden, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so they were open Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. uh, unless, unless they had a drag show, and then it was they were open on Monday for drag shows. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got, uh, I would go there f every night they were open. Yeah, I, I was hooked. I mean, we had a disco station on the radio in Detroit, WDRQ. You could hear all the all the great disco songs. Yeah, I, I think their their slogan was "Where Disco Never Dies." Uh, oh, mm -hmm. Wrong, <laughs> <laughs> but. You know, I, I I bought all the records. Mm -hmm. uh, that goes back to Mount Pleasant. So uh, the music is a big part of it f for you as well. What is your connection to music? Oh, okay. Well, I have a, a long connection to music. So my grandpa played the fiddle. Okay. In country, you know, those little pop-up bands in the Upper Peninsula, the, 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 wow. the square dances and things. And we'd beg him when I was little, he was old, you know, the, to play the fiddle. He had Mitch Miller albums. Uh, we had all sorts of records around the house, but they were that kind of music. Mm -hmm. uh, and I liked him. I mean, I loved him. Yeah. And I listened to the radio all the time. I, for, I remember the first time I heard Motown was on my mother's 1963 Chevy Bel Air. Had a great radio, and I could pick up CKLW from Windsor. <sighs> and that's where I heard Motown for the first time and instantly was just smitten with that music but i liked all the pop music too mm -hmm. of, of the 60s um there was a a concept well the, the company that operated the jukeboxes in town uh, when they were done with the records they sold them in their store for 19 cents well shit. so i would go buy 45s and i would play around like i'd, I'd walk down the street and look and if somebody had put out their old TV or their old radio, I'd look and I'd scavenge the speaker out of it so I could like wire up all these speakers at home. And, you know, I was just playing around with all that stuff. You know, I, I just love music. I loved records, I loved anything to do with it. You know, I'd, at night on the radio, I try and get stations from far away to listen to what music they were playing. And, you know, then I moved to Ann Arbor here. We got the club. I wanted to learn how to play music mix it together like I heard it in the club so I could mix it for myself to play in the car. And I went to Radio Shack and I bought all this turntable junk. Mm -hmm. It was junk. Um, and I, I kind of figured it out, basically. Um, so at the Rubiat in 1980, this was the time it was Labor Day weekend, and... The DJ was not going to be there, mm -hmm. and they were going to play tapes. And I got a call from one of the bartenders. He said, hey, do you want to come down and play music? I know you're interested in being a DJ. Well, he wanted to sleep with me. <laughs> that did not happen. Yeah. However, I came in, and I, I'm sure I was terrible. But uh, I did, did do the night, and I enjoyed it. And So, well, then there was a little job dispute, and that DJ quit okay. like a month or two later. And the manager said, uh, can you just come in and get us through Thanksgiving or get us through Christmas? Well, I was there for three years or two uh. years. Um, and so I was working three nights a week sometimes and going to work in the morning at the Ann Arbor News. Oof. I was young. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Burning the candle at both ends, but that has like a negative connotation to it. Well, You were just like living... 
I did that all the way through the end of my nectarine days, like 2001, 2002. I worked at the Ann Arbor News. And I, I did my book. Mm -hmm. uh, worked at the Ann Arbor News. I uh, worked as a DJ, you know, power naps in the afternoon. <laughs> Got to have them. Um, so I'd been at the, at the Rubiat for a couple of years, and we're talking now, it's 1984. And this guy, this older man, uh, comes up to my booth, and his name is John Carver. Hi, John. <laughs> and he he owned a rock and roll bar in Ann Arbor called the Second Chance. Mm -hmm. It was a live music bar. It was a rowdy, you know, rowdy rowdy place, uh, with a reputation for uh, uh, mm -hmm. bouncers that really bounced. So anyway, he's he's he'd been to New York and he thought he wanted to open up a New York style nightclub like he saw there. He wanted to convert his club to that. Okay, in what would be the big differences? What would be, how does one transform that space into a New York style? Well, the barn wood went away. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and all the old, all that old, old wood. It was all that wood, like, like, like going into one of those old steakhouses or something. You know? Wood paneling. Wood paneling, yep, all that. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, mirrors and, the light show was out of out of this world. It was it was three stories. Uh, he didn't spare any expense. Neon smoke machines, pyrotechnics, uh, confetti falling for everything. Mm. Uh, so he came and he wanted to start a gay night on Tuesday, and I, I said okay, I'll do that. So wow. I, I left the Ruby at, uh, started working Tuesday, uh, and it took off. So, but the thing you. You know, people always say, well, why is it just Tuesday? Why isn't it every night? And the answer at that was at that time, there weren't enough people willing to come out and be seen to have a, to support a place to stay open in Ann Arbor mm -hmm. all the time as a gay, gay place. But you could get one night. But you get one night. Yep. And it, was, it, it became a huge success. Uh, there was no other place hot on that night. You know, mm -hmm. Detroit had... You know, Backstreet had Wednesday and Menjo's had Thursday and some had Friday and what, but nobody had Tuesday. So that's you know, people came from Flint, people came from Detroit, from the west coast of Michigan. Uh, we, you know, we'd do some drag shows, we'd do some contests, uh, and it was so uh, several years went by, and so we decided to try it on Friday because the Friday that you you know. The same thing with gay pills with straight people. Nobody wants to go in the same place two nights in a row. <laughs> so Saturday was really strong for the straight people, and Friday was not a very busy night. So the owner's like, well, let's make another gay night. Yep. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> uh, so, so that became very popular. Mm -hmm. And for a while there, we had Sundays. So we had three nights. So there was a time where Necto, or the Nectarine Ballroom, rather, had gay nights Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday. Yes. Oh, and take me there. I, I used to joke. I said, yeah, we're, we're a gay bar with a straight night. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That seems more true. Yeah. 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 Um, in our previous conversation, when we were getting to know each other, you had mentioned that you were at Necto from day one. Yes. Um, or I should, really, I'm going to call it the Nectarine Ballroom from day one. Yeah. From its inception. What was that journey like getting off, getting um, that Tuesday night off its feet? And um, building this space, mm -hmm. not literally as much as, you know what I'm trying to say. A lot of people came to the first night because they wanted to check out this club they'd heard about. Uh-huh. Because it was pretty spectacular. You know, um, what made it spectacular? All the, well, three floors. Yes. You know, multiple bars, big fish tank, spiral stairs, light show, all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, and... I, I guess I did okay mm -hmm. uh, with, with it, you know, because they seemed to like it and come back. And, you know, but there was the griping about it only being gay one night a week and it being straight owned. And, you know, um, but I guess it didn't matter. Yeah. Uh, you know, we kept on going with it. You know, it, the, the horrible thing, I, I feel so bad about it to the stage. We called it a boys' night out. And that is so ex not inclusive. Yep. Um, I think it was pretty par for the course around that time, well, too. It was because, you know what? Women didn't spend money. Cliche? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe they didn't spend money on shots and yeah. beers. and yeah, the they, they didn't want to hear the, the club music. They wanted to hear, you know, name any, any, sure. any 
God, I'm drawing a blank, but Indigo Girls. I want to hear the Indigo Girls. <laughs> Can't dance to the Indigo Girls. Yeah. <laughs> you can do a little yeah. two-step or yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> you know, um, but, yeah, so the nightclub world, madness of the nightclub world. We, we had some, some t- I mean, uh, we brought in Divine. I was going to uh, say, you got to have yeah. some anecdotes. Oh, yeah, D- Divine was, was, was great. It was our first time that we had filled the club to capacity oh my gosh we got everybody we got the music or that yeah the people who like divine's uh, uh, disco songs mm. but also the people who were fans of the movies fans of john waters uh it was pretty wild the question and answer session was uh <sighs> just insane so what what does dog poop taste like <laughs> come here honey let me kiss your lips and i'll tell ya. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that was the cleanest thing I could tell you from yeah. the whole thing, by the way. Uh, <laughs> what was Divine like off stage? Wonderful. If yeah. Wonderful. Uh, you know, we had lunch together. As, you know, he was, he, mm-hmm. Glenn Milstead, yeah. uh, dressed as a guy. And we had a wonderful chat. You know, that, wow. You know, and, you know we, uh, we, we brought in Sylvester, disco singer from San Francisco, more than once, twice, I think. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was a hoot. <laughs> you were telling me you almost killed Sylvester. I almost killed Sylvester. <laughs> <laughs> you must tell us now. Oh, well, you know, he had performed at the Nectarine on Tuesday night, mm-hmm. and Backstreet was the Wednesday night bar. Okay. And you went there, and I went there separately. Mm-hmm. You know, and then... Uh, Comes about twelve thirty, and we're. He, he says, "Oh, he said, I'm I'm so tired." He says, "You know, would you drive me back to my hotel in Ann Arbor at the, at the time?" Well, okay, sure, I'll do that. Um, so it's it's the weather's bad. It's raining. It's so foggy you can't see anything, and I almost missed the turn off M14 where you come into downtown Ann Arbor, and Which I just still horrible. It's still horrible, and I sliced it kind of hard, and <laughs> and he throws his hands up, and he goes. I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! But, but we we also had lunch. We had lunch at the restaurant that used to be on top of the uh, building that's now the senior center, right downtown. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a, a beautiful restaurant up there with a nice view. We had lunch. Our server c- came out with somebody's tray, and he looked. He goes, "Oh my God, you're Sylvester!" <laughs> and he dropped all their food on the floor. <laughs> it was a big scene. It's a, we got his his name and we put him on the guest list. Yes. It was that was kind of fun and oh Sylvester was entertaining me with tales of of the old days. Oh, it was it was like So he dropped his plate and then you guys said we got you on the guest list yeah. cuz we know you're a real fan. Yeah, the whole tray. He dropped the whole tray. <laughs> uh, there was all sorts of stuff on there, you know. Uh, I I went to Dutch, uh, Sylvester had performed in Detroit the night before mm-hmm. and I uh, the owner lent me his Mercedes. And I drove to the Renaissance Center and picked mm. Sylvester up in a silver Mercedes. The luxury. I know, and I yeah. brought him brought him back, and we uh, uh, put him up uh, downtown there, and uh, just, it was so much fun. What's something about, well, first of all, for those who might not know, who is Sylvester? Sylvester was a disco diva from the San Francisco 19, late 70s, early 80s time frame. Uh, Dance With Me in the Disco Heat, uh, Do You Want a Funk was a, a super big hit for him. Mm-hmm. Um, passed away uh, of of AIDS in about eighty four, eighty five. Just he had just signed a a contract with Warner Brothers Records. He really had stepped up. He had a record out on Warner Brothers at the time. Um, and as I understand it, Sylvester wasn't afraid to throw on a little dress or, or some makeup. And oh, that was kind of big for. Or, or yeah, oh yeah, he was very very much into that. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, yes. So and, the trailblazer in that regard as well. Oh yes, yes, and. Uh, he was a gospel singer from oh. in the original, so he brought a lot of that gospel sensibility mm-hmm. to his performance with the high falsetto notes. You know, he oh, and I remember he had a fan like leave, oh, 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 you know, fabulous, big, maybe a headdress, and you know, he sang with the, the two women that uh, later became the Weather Girls, who sang "It's Raining Men." Yes, he, part of that, you know, part of that tradition with uh, Patrick Cowley, who pioneered synthesizer music in San Francisco in the late 70s. Uh, just uh, ma- an amazing history. And they're, they're actually, Sylvester wrote a book. Uh, and okay. I don't know if you can find it anymore. It's pretty old, but it might be called Disco Damaged. But I'm, Ooh. I'm not sure about that title. Disco Damaged. Disco Damaged. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
in outside of your run-ins with celebrities, well, also let me just say this. I used to work in the cafeteria mm-hmm. at University of Michigan Law School, and my boss was this woman named Tanya. And I, this was years ago, and I said to her something like, oh, I'm going to Necto tonight. And she told me in detail her story of going to Necto, the Nectarine Ballroom. Mm-hmm. At that time, I didn't even know that's what it was called. Mm-hmm. The Nectarine Ballroom and seeing Sylvester mm-hmm. and seeing her face light up that kind of conversation really influenced this podcast mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's just capturing these memories well you know here's a, t- this is interesting during covid and everybody's locked down mm-hmm. there i knew that there was a, a nectarine ballroom facebook page it was kind of inactive mm-hmm. at the time and i thought well this would be fun so I contacted the uh, the admin and I said, hey, do you mind if I kind of take over your page and post some memories and pictures? She's like, no, not at all. So I threw some pictures up there from my archive and I said, hey, we all got to stay at home right now. I said, why don't everybody dig in those boxes under your bed and the, your yes. photo albums and pull out some pictures and start posting the crazy, wonderful times we had at the Nectarine Ballroom. And they did. And they, it was just so many memories and so much fun and people were saying how wonderful it was what i got out of the whole thing was how much the nectarine ballroom meant to so many people at that time in what exactly did it mean to people at that time it was their place yeah it was their home it was their safe place it's where they they let loose where they met their their partner where, where all you know when you're young and you go out in the town and you dress up and you act stupid I mean, there were no cell phones, so there was no record of any of this, you know, to go on on a social media platform, fortunately. Um, but but it, it was like their, their home. Yeah. And it was the kind of place that, you know, even if you were a gay person and you came on a night that wasn't a gay night, you still did not feel uncomfortable. Mm. You know, it was, it, was, people, it was a dance club. People went there to dance, especially on, on the gay nights. With these spaces being less um, um, present, mm-hmm. uh, what does that make you feel like? Or I feel sad. Yeah. On one one hand. Yep. On the other hand, I'm really happy that you know there's a lot of places people can go anywhere and everywhere now. Yes. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. We don't have to kind of segregate into one spot, but you kind of miss a sense of the community that way uh, and then the joy of being around 500 people who are like you yes you, you know that that's a totally different experience uh, I sometimes miss the whole clandestine approach of the of the bars you know just, mm. just, you know you do know this is a gay night don't you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know there was a bar in Detroit that you had to ring the bell and they had to let you in they looked you over to see if you were okay. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I kind of, you know, you worried, oh, you were terrified in 1980 that somebody you worked with saw you in a gay bar mm-hmm. or saw you going into one. That was the real thing. Let alone your f- high school French teacher. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I saw a coworker at the Ruby out, and I, after about five minutes, I'm like, well, he's here. <laughs> yeah, we're both here. <laughs> we're both here. Well, he turns out he wasn't gay. He was just out to dance. Sure. He's, he's fine with everything. You know, still a good friend of mine to this day. Uh, but you worried about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you worried about what your friends would think. I had a, a fake romance at the Ann Arbor News with a, a woman who's a lesbian of my age. Yes, okay. Okay, so, so everybody thought clubs. we were the couple. You're in the nightclubs at night, but during the day, you're a journalist. Yeah. A photojournalist? Are you writing stories no, both? I'm, I'm writing stories and doing a few photos, I'm, but I'm mostly a reporter, and I'm going out and doing my reporter thing. Um, With also a little bit of a beard. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. so tell us about that. Your, your day job, how did you meet this woman, and how did you... I don't know. We just hit it off. She was, yeah. uh, she, she was the uh, newspaper librarian. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, when the newspaper came out, she'd clip the articles. Of, you know, there was no data retrieval system. You cut the article out and you put it in a folder where it goes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I guess I discovered her fairly, fairly early on. And there was another gentleman who worked there who was not gay, who was extraordinarily flamboyant. <laughs> and we would go out uh, to lunch all the time. Mm-hmm. And we'd show up at, like, if there was a company event, we'd sh- sh- she and I would show up together. People, would, people see what they want to see. Ah. And they see us together, and they just make the assumption. 
And we're like, all right, that's fine. Let's have, let's, okay, let's announce we're getting married. We're going to have a shower. We're going to get all those great <laughs> gifts. And then we'll break up and we won't have to give give those toasters back. <laughs> no, did you really do that? <laughs> we didn't do oh. it. No, we just joked about it. But I remember I, I'd meet her at her apartment in Tower Plaza and she we'd drink beforehand. Mm-hmm. And then she'd fill her purse up with like a bottle of rum and a bottle of something because they didn't <sighs> check back then. And you know, you make your own drinks under the table in the dark and hope nobody saw you. <laughs> you are sounding like me. Uh, <laughs> I know a little bit about that myself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, then, uh, uh, oh, the Ruby out. So we had the first Pac Man game in the city. In the city. And oh, the that's going to bring people in. The first Ms. Pac Man. Which I prefer. Yep. We, of course. <laughs> we had the first uh, place that played music videos. That's huge. Yeah. Um, the owner installed a TV and it brought me into, up to the DJ booth. This massive Betamax machine. It looked like a suitcase. Yeah. It had a, a gate or a door that opened up on the top with a wham. And you'd shove this <laughs> massive tape in. Wait, what's a wham? <laughs> Wait, say that again. Wham. You'd hit it with your fist. <laughs> bam. And the, <laughs> and the door would close. And, and then it was, you know, you couldn't mix tapes, be mm-hmm. mix them. Although... By the time I got to the Nectarine, I was getting pretty good. Yeah. It wasn't Betamax anymore. It was regular tapes. But And you just show this, the video, and then you'd go mix into a song after that. And everybody's like, oh, look at, oh, that's what, oh, look at that, Janet Jackson. Oh, look at that. <laughs> and that still hasn't gone away. Like, if I'm at the club and the DJ mm. mixes two songs together, and, and I love both the songs or it's mm. interesting or whatever it might be, my jaw's on the floor. Yeah. I'm like, what? But I want to go back to something. You didn't, tr- you and your lesbian lover, wink, wink, at well, the Ann Arbor News, you didn't have to try too hard. If you just showed up and were together, that right, was enough. Right. No, we didn't have to kiss or anything. Like that. No. And you, you weren't like, this is my fiance. No, we never said a word about that. The people just made assumptions. There is something there. Yeah. yeah. People will fill in the blanks. Yeah, people will fill in the blanks. It was, <laughs> it was pretty funny. Yeah, and so here I am. I've just moved to Ann Arbor. It's 1979. I'm curious about the community. Mm-hmm. So under the guise of a newspaper reporter, I found out about this gay church up on Plymouth Road, Northville. There, there was a Presbyterian church, I think it is, or Episcopal. I think it's Episcopal church. It had mm-hmm. a, a gay minister and a gay service. In 1979? Yeah, 79, 80. I think well, St. The- Aidan's, I think, Episcopal church. I think it's still there, in fact. St. Aidan's Episcopal Church. Yeah. Oh, th- my gosh. Okay. Pretty sure. Um, so I went to my editor and said, hey, this is a, oh, sounds like a really good story. These gays got their own church up here. We could do this story. So I sold about it. Mm-hmm. You know, but I had an agenda. Of course, I wanted to find out about this. The, yeah. And meet some people at this church. It of course. A social hour. <laughs> um, uh, so then... That one, I, I did that story, and it was fine. There was no repercussions. And then so another some time had con- gone past, and, and uh, I said, well, I'm going to do a story on gay nightlife, see what they say about that. The bar called the Rubia, this bar called the Flame. And they went for it, yeah. you know. And again, you know, no assumption that I was. But as time went by, <laughs> as they say, I think it became, became pretty much... Well yeah. known that, that that I was gay, and uh, the the thing that made me realize that was somebody, another reporter, came over to me and he said he had written this particular sentence or th- something, and did did I think the gay community would find it offensive? And I'm like, how would I know? How would I know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are you asking me for a particular reason? Yeah. And then <laughs> another one came over and said, my son has decided to start wearing an earring. Does that mean? <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't know. Which ear is it in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta talk about that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but you know, by the time I, the Ann Arbor News closed in I think 2008 or wherever mm-hmm. it was, I mean, there was absolutely no question. It had not been for years. You know, it was fine. And you worked with them through 2008. Yeah, whenever they closed, I was there for 30 years. Oh my gosh! And I was a a reporter. Uh, I was a feature writer. I was a assistant editor of the feature section. And then I left actually for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to work for a management consulting company, okay, uh, and then went back to the paper part time, uh, and then went back to full time eventually. Uh, my last job there, which was my dream job for the whole thirty years, and I got to have it for like one year, was arts and entertainment editor. Ooh. But I'd been covering the arts scene for five or six or more years before that. 
Is oh. there a particular story or series of stories that you're most proud of or that sticks out to you the most in your memory? I, I loved, you know, doing reviews and I loved doing the concert previews. So, like, mm. concert pre you don't meet the person, you talk to them on the phone. So... <sighs> But you know, I interviewed Gordon Lightfoot, who was one of my heroes with Record the Fitzgerald. Stuff. Oh yeah, when he found out I was from Sault Ste. Marie, it was like, oh my God, we're old friends. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, who else? Oh, uh, Joan Baez. She was one of my favorite interviewers. What makes yeah. a good? Um, what makes it your favorite? Uh, well, the rapport. Yes. So we we had a prearranged time as, as often as you arrange a time for the interview with the publicist. So my phone rings and I say, you know. And our news, this is Roger. And she goes, hi, Roger, it's Joan. And I'm like, hi, Joan. And as I often did to break the ice, I said, where are you calling me from today? Yeah. And she said, well, I'm in Kansas. And I'm like, what are you doing in Kansas? How did you get to Kansas? She <laughs> goes, well, I clicked my heels together three times, and <laughs> here I was. <laughs> you know, she, she was, oh, so fun. Arlo Guthrie, I talked to Dr. J J Jackson Brown, all these wow. people. But the craziest interview ever was and you're not going to be surprised yoko ono okay so first of all i was told by her publicist under no uncertain terms was i not to bring up whether she broke the beatles up or not taboo okay. taboo subject yep she was coming to town because john lennon also was an artist and there was an exhibition of his work at u of u of m museum of art she was coming to town for that and she publicist has sent out a note saying she was open to interviews so well, wow we had to talk to yoko ono yeah so she calls you know talk calls up hello hi how are you whatever you know and i asked my i had thought of my questions you got to have these questions ready so i said do you think if john had lived he'd be just as well known now for his artwork as his music that's a solid question heck yeah and she should have a solid answer she goes well, John was always ahead of his time. He was the first person to push babies around Central Park in a perambulator. <laughs> Who? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Record scratch. Yeah. And, and, and there, there wasn't much more to be gained out of that interview, really, with her. And, you know, I think I touched on, she, she had some records out. I said, mm -hmm. oh, I'm a DJ. I played the records in the club. And, you know, she said, oh, that's nice, blah, blah, blah. So, anyway, I'm not going to get any more out of this lady. <laughs> So, Did she think she was being funny, or was she just... I don't. I, th I just think she's on another planet, yes. quite honestly. Um, so I said, well, Miss Ono, thank you for your time. And she said, oh, no, 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 Yoko, call me Yoko. <laughs> and I, 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 I'm sorry to do the accent thing, but it's <laughs> germane to the story. Yeah. So I sit down at my computer, and I'm like, how in the hell am I going to make any sense of this story at all? Yes. So I wrote it straight just like I'm telling it to you. Yep. I said, I had this most amazing interview with Yoko Ono. <laughs> so, That's incredible. Uh, so the, I did a lot of reviews. The most horrible feedback I ever got was when Bob Dylan was at EMU and I trashed uh, him. Yeah, well. <sighs> you know, the thing was, it was mumble, mumble, mumble in the wind, mumble, mumble, mumble. Eh, eh. You know, it was horrible, you know, and it wasn't the fact that it was in an arena, and it wasn't because Elvis Costello opened, he was fantastic, mm. the band was fantastic, uh, Dylan's band was fantastic, he was awful, I had a friend of mine go with me, I apologized, I said, I owe you a date somewhere else. Yeah. Sometime. So I wrote it like I, I saw it, and who are you to dare, dare to say anything bad about the great Bob Dylan? Uh. Uh. Oh, and he would express that to you? No, no, some fans. Some These, fans. You know, the fans were rabid. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Well, I think, oh, but, Bob Dylan. You know, my, my, I mean, I grew up with Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of his meanings of his songs escape me, but I, I, there's a lot of them I do like. Absolutely. And uh, I, I understand his influence on music and, and all that, but I, I, I felt like as a reporter, I'm, I'm not a fanboy. Yeah. I, I'm there to... Tell people my opinion. You, they're free to have their own. Um, uh, I used to go out with the restaurant critic from the Ann Arbor News, too, and we, and, oh, we ate so much. Uh, <laughs> so you're doing, uh, or you're participating in restaurant reviews, music reviews, movie reviews, theater I, reviews? Occasionally movie reviews, a lot of theater reviews. Yeah. I, I was like the backup theater critic. I didn't get to do any great theater stuff, but we covered 
all of the theater companies mm -hmm. with reviews of all of their shows and in Ann Arbor and also EMU, all that put together, mm -hmm. plus you know places like we had the Performance Network at that point, the okay. Purple Rose, all those theaters, so far too much for one person. What a oh. dream, though. But, oh, my God. I, I, I would sometimes be out reviewing four nights a week. Ah. And I'd have to come back to the newspaper uh, and later at home once we had computers and write that review for the next day's paper. So I would be, you know, still at 2 o'clock. I'm wrapping up this, this review. Um, nice. I would take notes on the play in the dark. That's fun. Try and read them later. <laughs> it, um, but, but I loved it. I loved going to do that. It was the, it was the best job ever. And I was just lucky to, to have it for the time that I did. It's too cool. Oh, my God. If, do you like musical theater at all? Yeah, very much so. Interviewed Patty Lapone. Oh. Betty Buckley. Oh, shit. And who am I missing out of the three? Oh, oh well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> the big three. <laughs> uh, Jennifer Holliday. N didn't talk to her. Patty Lapone, Betty Buckley. And that would lose with Cheetah Rivera. No, not her. Oh, gosh. I forget now, too. But also, <laughs> one of my favorite interviews doing with musical theater is Audra McDonald. Oh. Mm -hmm. who, went, who went to the University of Michigan. I didn't know that. She did. And when she would come to town, she would always make time to go and, and visit and do master classes over at the theater. She is such a lovely human being. And you so, can just feel it. Yeah. Even over the phone, she is so warm and engaging. Mm. Um, I interviewed Brandy Carlisle a couple times before she was huge. She was would be playing in in Ann Arbor, starting out at the small places. Uh, I happen to love the Avid Brothers. Uh, they started out at the at the uh, Blind Pig, and you know gradually worked their way up. It's did a, a lot of you, you if you do it for a while, you see a, a progression in in where they were playing. But I also interviewed a lot of local bands, and and I really have a lot of admiration for people that try and make it in in any kind of arts business because it is more work than anybody ever thinks mm -hmm. and putting yourself out there putting yourself out there exactly um other than your bob dylan review is there another review that is sticks out to you maybe because uh you loved the the art so much or maybe not so much or uh, you know the thing is there were so many and I saved everyone too. I clipped that out of the paper, and I just went through my tub, <laughs> a tub of <Yes>. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> tub of stuff. Yeah, it's like, who's gonna ever want these? I don't even want these. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of anything that's. Oh, I remember there's an artist named Jonathan Edwards. Mm -hmm. He had one hit in the set called Sunshine. Okay. So he was he was going to be the MC of the Ann Arbor Folk Festival that year. So we had set up an interview time. And we had a wonderful phone interview, say, on a Tuesday. And on Wednesday, I get a phone call from him saying, I am so sorry I missed our interview yesterday. <gasps> <laughs> oh. I'm like, all right. Yeah. Did <laughs> well, you just do it again? <laughs> no, no, we didn't. Yeah, I yeah. said, you know, I, I said, I understand you have a lot of interviews. It's really yeah. super easy to get them all confused. But um, so that, that was that was another pretty, pretty funny one. Yeah. Um, you know, they... I hate to say they blend together. John Mayer before John Mayer wow. was 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 big. He was singing at EMU, so I talked to him on the phone. He started inter interviewing me. He's like, <laughs> "Well, now," he said, "Now I'm sitting back. I'm picturing you as you maybe you have a beard and you're about 35." <laughs> uh, it's incredible mm -hmm. to, um, like I said before, what a dream. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so here's the thing: you live in Ann Arbor, right? Mm -hmm. And you have Hill Auditorium, you have the Michigan Theater, you have all these venues right by the Nectarine. Mm -hmm. So, oh, let's say I'm going to go see Patti Lapone or, or somebody at the Michigan Theater at Hill. I just walk out the door and go down to the Nectarine and start my shift. I'd, ha I'd hire somebody to, to play for the mm -hmm. first hour because there's nobody there anyway. <laughs> um, and then I go to these fabulous world-class shows and then just go, go to work. And occasionally, oh, hope they come in. I hope they came in. But they're generally so tired, they don't even want to come in. Did any ever, anyone ever show up at the Nectarine? No, but yeah. you know, back when I worked at the Rubiat, mm -hmm. Leonard Bernstein used to come there after his concerts at Hill Auditorium. Ooh. Yeah, he'd have his, and he came to the Nectarine also once. 
Uh, I remember because I, I was working in the booth and I didn't hear about any of this till, till after he was there. But you know, oh, Mr. Bernstein was in tonight with his boys. Uh, he I had so, he I, had a he he brought his own gold rimmed cocktail glass. Uh. <laughs> and it was engraved LB. Oh, jeez. So, and legend has it he went into the flame, and he looked around, and he said, "What a goddamn dump!" <laughs> and he turned around and left. But the thing is, he wasn't wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Maybe he's a little Betty, Betty Davis fan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it may have been a dump, but it was our dump. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. If, if so, a little, just a little bit about the flame. Yeah, it was very rundown. It okay. was it was a dive bar with the emphasis on the dive. There were sp- spider plants in the window that had been dead for years, <laughs> but it was to keep the tourists out. Yeah, you guys don't really want to come you in don't, here. You, this is a warning sign. You don't want to come <laughs> in here. Um, it was long and it was narrow, and the bar was provided over presided over by a, a Greek gentleman named Harry, and Harry was a legend in this town. Uh, he often was enjoying the libations as much as the customers, mm-hmm. but he was a straight man with the kindest heart mm-hmm. that you ever wanted to see. And I just yeah. remember, uh, hi, Harry, I'll have a vodka tonic. And he'd pour the vodka in there and he'd go, oh, no, no, that's not a drink. No, no. And he'd, oh, <laughs> shit, take the bottle and put more, more, you know, yeah. there, okay. And then I'd go to pay him, he'd go, he'd tap my head, he'd go, no, no, not this time, not my friend. No, uh, I mean, I'm sure he did that with a lot of other people. Yes. Um, so when somebody else bought the bar, the first thing he installed was one of those measured shot pouring things. Boo, Took tomatoes, all tomatoes, fun. tomatoes. Boo, everybody <laughs> yeah. hated it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> So the, the drugs flowed freely at the flame, I mm-hmm. will have to tell you. They, you know, there was the guy that came in and took up his spot at the back table every night about 10.30. Some commerce. Uh, yeah, co- you know, and everybody, the, I'm sure that the bartender knew what was going on. Of course he did. Everybody knew, you know. Sure. So, so but I remember, I think I told you when we talked on the phone about my friend John, who came, it was a long bar. And this was, uh, yeah, in like in the early evening, he came in on roller skates. <laughs> And he came in the front door and he screamed, I don't know how to stop. <laughs> and he roller skated through the bar at a high rate of speed and right out the back door. And we all just, what? <laughs> Zoom. What happened there? <laughs> well, thank God there was somebody in the back to open the door for or, him. Or it may have been open, but yeah. uh, we would try and leave the Rubiat in time to get to the flame for last call because we could stay there until 2.30. And you said the the flame kind of had this kind of a more divey um, mm-hmm. reputation. Yeah. What was the reputation of the, of the Rubiat? Oh, it was, it was much more, uh, a little bit more upscale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Not that it was, I mean, our competition turned out eventually to be like Backstreet and the nicer places in Detroit. I see. And, you know, when those places opened up, like we had a big Wednesday night was a big night for us. And then Backstreet opened and it's a short drive and their night was Wednesday and boop. <laughs> the guys, we lost all our guys. Yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons, in fact, that the Rubiat closed is the Nectarine took away a lot of their business. Okay. Um, uh, so it was a little bit, little bit more upscale, but you, you wanted to get over there before last call, and all your friends were there. I mean, you'd walk in, there was like cheers. You knew yes. everybody in that place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you went, know, who's that guy? He's from out of town. Oh. Oh. And another thing that was would probably boggle people's minds is it was very discriminatory against women back then. Mm-hmm. Didn't have any women at the flame. You know, at Backstreet, you didn't. Women didn't go to Backstreet. They would get hassled. And why do you think you know? men dominated these spaces? By that, I, I just really can't answer. I guess sure. they put up the money and opened the business. But, um, the, the 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 fuss that was raised when Backstreet hired a female waitress oh no oh it was you know and it, you know it didn't take long everybody adored her mm-hmm. you know but yes. it's just the fuss that people put up huh. now the, the nectar ring was never that way and i kind of i see that a lot to this day um like whether it's going to a gay campground that is men only mm. or you know lesbians can come to the campground on this day but not on this day it's like oh geez uh, uh, yeah. It doesn't click for me. No. Well, the thing to remember about those days is like, you say, oh, they're the dark, dark ages. We had a great time. Yes. We had so much fun. 
there was no limit to the fun we could have. Yeah, yeah. We had our places. We we knew each other. Uh, you know, I remember <laughs> I had a cold and I had a hanky and I put it in my back pocket and somebody followed me home. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you were like, this is for my snot. <laughs> yeah, right. And like, okay, uh, kids today listening, hankies. What, what, what are we talking about? We had a different color hanky in your back pocket and what side it was on meant you were into different things. And it was a way to, 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 to share that with other people non-verbally. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and now we just have grinder. Oh. Wah, wah. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I went to a bar in Chicago, mm -hmm. and there were ten guys sitting at the bar, all on their phones, probably talking to the guy over there. Yes. So you're all already there. Yeah, I just turn around. I and don't. I don't understand that the whole thing. Like when cell phones came in, and I'm DJing. Like, how can you even hear the guy on the other end of the phone? <laughs> you're in a disco. <laughs> yeah. Who are you talking to? <laughs> yes. Uh, um, there's something, it's wonderful that we can meet in these kind of uh, digital spaces, because mm -hmm. there's a safety element there. Mm -hmm. But I, I wonder if, if that positive really outweighs all the negatives. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, in the 80s, my schedule was uh, work at the bar one night, work at the bar the next night, go to the flame the next night, go to the back street the next night. Maybe I'd take Monday off. I don't know. But I was out all the time, very, very social. Mm hmm I'm a very social person, and I, I would, I was afraid I was missing something. Sure. If I was at home. And you're kind of being a DJ. You're kind of got a bird's eye view of what's going on in the club. Yeah, that's pretty funny. I'm sure you've seen uh, all <laughs> sorts of things. Yeah. Well, early on when the nectarine was was three levels, mm -hmm. on a slower night there would be nobody up on the top level really. And it would be a place for people to go make out. Mm -hmm. So you'd look out over there and you'd see somebody's head go up and down and up and down. And you know, So you took the big spotlight and went, wham! <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> just, just a mess with them and watch to see how fast they went running. You know. Yes. Uh, I, I, I remember one guy, you, had to go all the way, you still have to go all the way down this long flight of stairs to go to the bathroom. And there was a guy, and he was at the top stair, but he didn't realize there were stairs. He was so drunk. Oh. And he just flew out into the void. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whee! Yeah, and landed at the bottom. And he, he was dazed. And he picked himself up, and he goes, I'm okay. <laughs> he just, like a little kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. And he just kept on going. I'm okay. His friends were like, Oh, that's good. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't laugh too hard at that because that's about to be me tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just be aware of those bathrooms. The longest walk to the bathroom in any nightclub ever. Uh, uh, um, so one thing that was really helped for me, and you know, me being a music geek, a mm -hmm. record geek, is in the mid '80s I got chosen to be a reporter for Billboard magazine's uh, dance chart panel. Cool. So they had 100 people in, in the United States. They'd phone every week, and you'd give them your top 20 over the phone, and they'd use that to make the national chart. So, of course, all the Holy record... Holy shit. Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah. So all the record companies, of course, they want the, the reporters to mm -hmm. have all the new stuff. Mm -hmm. Mail at my house every single day was like Christmas. You would open the door, and the packages would fall in. All the latest 12-inch singles, all of the remixes... Uh, when and then video came out, all the music videos were coming in the door, hats, sweatshirts, various pieces of swag. Uh, it was, and then I of course have to go listen to it. But um, <laughs> so, and, do you remember any particular crazes? Like I think about like voguing, house uh, music, the voguing. Oh yeah, <laughs> t tell us about that. Uh, something I, you know, I might be a little rusty on this. So forgive me. Sure. Uh, I came out of the New York house music mm -hmm. scene at in the 80s and it, it came really to the forefront because madonna did that song called vogue oh, okay and yes, everybody yes. knew how to vogue all, all you know doing the, all the motions and the hands and uh, all kinds of crazy things and so so that was a super big craze uh -huh. uh, we had a, a little area at the nectarine that in the it was the coat check area in the winter but we would disassemble that in the summer and it was like a little dance floor mm -hmm. that nobody ever used so people were up there practicing their vogue <gasps> Uh, then the Detroit Free Press came over and did a story on the Vogers at the Nectarine. We had the, the House of Chanel was here. I think they're they're still active. Now Max, I Max interviewed Maxi Chanel and those folks. Yeah. I interviewed Maxi Chanel, a former Miss Flame. Yep. Um, and she was telling me that she would have the House of Chanel, and they would come in, they would Vogue, and they yep. would Kiki, and all that, and they wouldn't. Yep. All, all of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, that was really great fun. So and I, 
I remember when techno came came in. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very popular. Uh, with the one funny thing uh, that uh, we had a manager uh, in the '90s, Sonia Saponsic. Actually, she was wonderful. Um, and we cooked up this idea that we needed to have a disco night because we saw we heard that disco was coming back. So we went to the the owner, and he thought we had lost our minds. <laughs> so we got him to agree to let us do it once on a Wednesday night. So she got all the staff members together, dressed everybody up in, in disco attire with a boom box on their shoulder and walked yep. all around campus handing out free passes. And we you know the rock that everybody paints. Of you know, course. We painted the rock. And yeah, we, yeah. We, we, the, the promotion was just crazy and we packed the place. Uh. And so Sonia and I talked and I said, yeah, okay, we're taking control of this. Mm -hmm. So without checking with the owner, we just got in the microphone and said, and because it's such a successful night, we'll see you back here next Wednesday <laughs> and every Wednesday after that. Yes. But he had made so much money. Oh. You know, that uh, he didn't care because we, we were closed on Wednesday. Now he's got something making money. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, that thing was such a success. It ran for about three years. I got so sick of disco. <laughs> I, said, I, I listened to this stuff the first time around, and now I'm, I'm yeah. listening to it again. Yeah. Well, then, of course, based on the fact that that retro nonsense was a hit, we decided we needed to have an 80s night. Mm -hmm. And we put it on a Saturday. Thousand people. Every One thousand people. That, the capacity of the club was far less than that. Yeah. Um, we were so crowded. We were so crowded every single night. Wow. It was, and I, I loved DJing that night. You could. You could play anything. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you could you could throw in an ACDC song or there's uh, Sweet Home Alabama or one of the, you know people just went nuts for that. Very mixed crowd on that night mm -hmm. too. It was, you know, we if I played I played at that point it was a mix of records and CDs, uh, and uh, so if you played certain songs like Jump by the Pointer Sisters. You couldn't play the record. You had to play the CD because if you played the record and 900 people jumped at once yes. and came down, your record's going to skip. <laughs> what a wonderful problem to have. Oh, and oh, God, there was a, a medley of Grease hits Ooh. that, oh, that never want to hear that again. Um, <laughs> if I had a dollar for every time I played Dancing Queen, uh -huh. which still packs a floor anywhere you go, by the way. Whether it's a wedding reception, yep. a first yep. communion. Yep. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will survive. We are family, love shack, any of those. Uh, if I had, yeah, Footloose, any of that stuff. Oof. Is there an artist or song that you were passionate about that you wish kind of had more of that time in the light or? Oh, there were a ton of songs. You know, yeah. the, the whole key to Disco Night was that those, those songs were popular enough in the mainstream to be played on the radio or by their, the, their parents mm -hmm. of the kids. So if you strayed much from that stuff that had been super popular, even if it had been hugely popular in the clubs only, you lost everybody. Uh. So there was so much good music um, that wasn't the village people. <laughs> By the way, yeah. you, know, you get 900 people doing the whole YMCA thing with their hands. That's fun to watch. Wish I had a video of that. Yeah. Um, but there was, yeah, there was a lot of great music that, that uh, just didn't get aired because it wasn't popular enough. If you needed to get the dance floor jumping, you named some, but did you have some go-to? Oh, yeah. Well, that, this goes for any night I played. Yep. You know, especially it's 10 o'clock, and nobody's had enough to drink yet. Yes. It's not very busy. So, you know, you, you kind of salt the, seed the seed the whole thing <laughs> by playing something that's super popular. Uh -huh. I could play it again. You know, so you might work in a We Are Family or or something by Chic or Donna Summer Hot Stuff or just, yep. to, just to get them going. You know, chances are once you get them going, they'll stay going. Yeah. Unless you do something really stupid with the music. <laughs> um, this, this is an Ask a DJ question. How do you feel about taking requests? Uh, requests are fine in their time. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so requests between 9 and 11.30 are okay. They're mm -hmm. fine. But after that, when the club is jammed with people, 
and you're working for everybody, requests are a pain in the ass. Yeah. They really are. I can imagine. You know, I mean, here I, here I am. Okay, I got a song playing over here on this turntable. I got headphones on. I've got another song I'm queuing up in the headphones on the other turntable and matching the beats together. And somebody's knocking on my arm. Hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Can you play Lady Gaga? Yeah. Yes. So, so there was one night I was playing a, a new song by Madonna, mm -hmm. actually. And this, this woman comes up, says, can you play something by Madonna? And I said, oh, well, this is Madonna. She goes, well, I don't know it. And I said, well, I'm not responsible for your musical ignorance. <laughs> yeah. And she goes, the joke goes right over her head. She goes, oh, no, no, I know you're not. It's <laughs> It was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to kill the dance floor, what's the song you're playing before the lights go on? <laughs> I, I, didn't do, the, yeah. I didn't do that. Yeah. I didn't want I didn't kill the dance floor. Sure. I, I left them on the top of the world. And if I wanted to bring them down, which I kind of would do, I might play Drop the Tempo Way Down. Mm -hmm. And that's where, like, a Dancing Queen or a Last Dance by Donna Summer, mm. just to... Kind of, I want to. It's like the theater. I want them to leave singing. Yes. And happy. That's my whole whole job. So, I want to leave them up. So, starting at one o'clock, the tempo's going up. Yep. And it's staying up. Yeah. And they'll dance to anything at that point. They're drunk. They've had their <laughs> ecstasy. They're doing whatever. Men are little friends. Yeah. Our little boo things. Yep. And they're and they're shaving their or, or say, uh, <laughs> waving their hands in the air, all that kind of stuff. So. So I want to leave them with that bang at the end, yeah. but I save enough time to drop it down. Uh, let's see, Patsy Cline, mm -hmm. Walking After Midnight on the video. Oh, nice. Or uh, Nancy Sinatra, These Boots Are Made for Walking. That always was a great come down song. Are you ready, Boots? Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, so, so I never, you know, I remember the owner coming up to me and saying, Brudge, we're not selling any booze. Everybody's dancing. Play a bad song. It's like, <laughs> I can't play a bad song. It's I can't not, do it's that. It's not in me. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so it's uh, like, it's like, play a ballad. I'm not playing a ballad at 11 o'clock at night. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd play something new and down tempo and try and, you know, get them some drinkers. And sure. So, you know, it's always funny to watch you get on the microphone and say, all right, for the next 10 minutes, Long Island tea, iced teas are a dollar. And watch your dance floor empty. <laughs> oh, I just got like war flashbacks and nervous yeah. at the idea of one dollar Long Island iced teas and the people oh. just oh, I, I was, it. I was going through some flyers and how did we get away with 25 cent well drinks from nine to 10? 25 cents? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, I'm I'm wrapped up in the feeling of the club. Mm. Um, s so we we opened up another club in the basement, by the way. We call it the Red Room now. Yes. Okay, but that that used to be where they stored the beer to keep it cool. Okay. And before that, it was even a nightclub. That's that was a fur storage room for ladies' furs in Ann Arbor because it was oh. cool. So it was summer storage. So we have this great nightclub, and I go to New York City. For uh, music, they have a. You always have a, a new music seminar there in the summer, and I go to this club, and it's the big disco upstairs with all the flashing lights. But down in the basement, they have a room, and there's no flashing lights, and there's a portable bar, and everyone is down there. Yes. And it's hot. It's it's hot. It's just it's just where everybody is. Mm -hmm. I come back to Ann Arbor, and I go, well, we got a room. We got a room, and I, you know, it's not being used. Let's make put a club in there oh the owner was not no we're not gonna do it. he never wanted to spend money on anything it's just you know. so but we he grudgingly <laughs> let us do something down there <laughs> and we named it the sludge club <laughs> so we called it the sludge club because when the sewer pumps backed up that's where the water went no. the sludge yeah and anybody remembers those days don't even <laughs> doesn't happen anymore oh but. man so it was hot, the air conditioning, the, it was so hot in there in the summer that, that water ran down the walls from the humidity. Oh. Did anyone care? No. no. We had a DJ down there. We put some kick-ass speakers in there, though, and a bartender, and it was pretty wild. And it went pretty good. Then we started counter-programming a little bit to what I was playing upstairs. So mm -hmm. if I was playing poppy, poppier club music, we had a DJ down there playing underground club yep. music. 
uh, it, that worked super well, and it still works. It, it's still going c- crazy down there in the Red Room. Oh, my gosh. We, uh, when my friends say we're going to Necto, we didn't even say Necto. We said we're about due f- to go to Red Room. Yeah, yeah. In uh, just a different vibe. Yeah. Then you get to taste all the different vibes. Yeah. You, you know, multiple and, vibes. I mean, I th- it's kind of like the feeling of back in the old day when you could go to multiple clubs. Oh, sure. I don't like it over here. Let's go over there. Yep. Oh, I don't like it up here. Let's go down to the Red Room. <sighs> Oh, I remember <laughs> the red room had closed 15 minutes before I did upstairs. Mm-hmm. So all the red roomers had come up. They'd have to come up and spend their last time with me. And the red room DJ came up and I was playing a song that was popular at the time. King of my castle by the mm-hmm. Wham project. It was what it was. He goes, this is one of my songs. You can't play my songs. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you're poaching my stuff. I know. I was like, it's a great song. Why wouldn't I play? <laughs> well, now you had brought a folder of clippings and ads and all sorts of wonderful th- um, paper memorabilia from yeah oh just look at the, just even seeing the word nectarine yeah and that cheesy logo we had I love it yeah so um, my my joke has always been if they change the name again since it was nectarine ballroom nectarine necto they're just gonna have to change it to N because there's no more shortening <laughs> yeah. well, I think we gotta go back to nectarine ballroom we should so you know why it was called the nectarine right no you know I'll tell you. Uh, John Carver told me, he said, it's because the nectarine is the sweetest fruit. Ooh. So. <laughs> a juicy fruit. Yeah, and I, I have a sign in my basement on, on plexiglass that says, you must have proper attire to enter the club. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at a newspaper. Is this a newspaper clipping? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Metro, and it's DJ I'd, Rogers' top 15 dance hits of 1990. Yep. Incredible. Hold on and Vogue. Pump up the jam, Technotronic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pump that body, Mr. <laughs> Lee. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, and of course number well, number two, Groove is in the Heart. Oh yeah. So that it's still a floor packer. That song will never die. And it was a brilliant song. It it still is a brilliant song. That's a house party song. Mm-hmm. That you you could play that. That's a first communion song. Yep. Yep. <laughs> number that, one, of that, course, Vogue. That that goes with Dancing Queen. You know, I mean you <sighs> Oh, oh flip, felt that one overseas. That that's uh, there's a picture of a boy in a swimming pool if you, cause you can't see it with a whistle around his neck. Beca- and I stole it from someplace because you know what, sex sells. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Hot fun in the summertime. Yep, yep. Oh, this is a Mr. Nectarine ballroom contest oh, yes. fire. We, we we had a Miss Nectarine, which uh, and also a Mr. Nectarine. Uh, Oof. Hosted by Miss Trixie Deluxe. Trixie Deluxe uh, was a drag queen in Ann Arbor, my favorite drag queen of all time. Uh, what and, makes her your favorite? Uh, because she was so much fun to work with. Yeah. And not. I don't want to get all the drag queens of the world mad at me. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, tread lightly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, she was just a person. She didn't have attitude. She was, yeah. you know, she was so. All the songs were always ready for the DJ to play in perfect order. Um, you know, she was she was just that person, and uh, uh, she passed away in the '80s. We were all so sad about it. It wasn't HIV; it was something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we you know, miss her a lot. But yes. she she emceed all of our drag shows, of course. And she had a kind of she kind of looked like Carol Burnett uh. a little bit. So she'd put on that washerwoman outfit, and she'd do <laughs> that little washerwoman yeah. bit, and she'd pull on her ear, and, uh, uh. and she'd do. Uh, oh, the uh, there was a song out called "The Homecoming Queen's Got a Gun" by mm-hmm. Julie Brown. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was hysterical. She would do Homecoming Queen's Got a Gun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trixie Deluxe. And Trixie, you know, you know Trixie's still around. She uh, performs in Detroit once a month. Really? Oh, yeah. Yep. And I think she performed last weekend, in fact, uh, for uh, it's a Drag Queen Brunch or Drag Queen Bingo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She comes up from Florida. Shout out to Trixie Deluxe. We, we got to talk to Trixie Deluxe. Get yeah. Trixie Deluxe on the show. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, uh, so I. Uh, um, Nectarine had an alternative music night on Monday night, and the guy that was doing it left. And the owner was like, oh, we'll just kill it. I said, no, before you do that, give me a chance. Um, So although it wasn't exactly my music, I I discovered that I really, really liked it. So uh, what you're looking at is we'd give away a lot of records because I was a billboard reporter, so I could get boxes of records and what have you to give away. Tape giveaways and video premieres. Yes, yes. And it, is the, these are the Smiths? The Smiths, yeah. I was giving away something that the Smiths had come out with at that time. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. We got to get the library to, to somehow. Oh yeah, I, I've scanned all these and more, many uh, clippings. No. <laughs> What is this? <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> this appears to be a chalk. It, it's an it's ad. Chalk. It's a flyer. Yeah. And it's a chalkboard, and it says uh, repeatedly, I promise never again to sleep with Sean when his boyfriend is at the library. I promise never again to sleep with... <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I wish I could say I did that one, but yeah. I, I did not. So... Uh, <laughs> the boy of summer contest. Oh yes, one of the, one of the categories was size of your surfboard. Oh oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and I see here you can wear a swimwear or beach attire. Yeah, so we got one of those <laughs> wading pools for kids. Put it on the stage with water in it, and the the Trixie or Lisa or whoever the host was would get a pitcher of water, cold, ice cold from the bar, <laughs> pour it down their swimsuit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that when you hysterical. think it's too much fun, you weren't lying. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then of course on um, <laughs> we have our New Year's Eve celebration, but, but on January first, hangover party, bloody <laughs> Marys are. <laughs> well, there's no place. That's to, good thinking. There's no place to go on New Year's, right? So, and if you're gonna scrape yourself off the floor of your house to to get to somewhere, it would be somewhere like one dollar Bloody Marys all night long. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't be packed, but we did. And we also did a decent crowd night before Thanksgiving, because we because uh, of Ann Arbor having a lot of international students that don't go back overseas mm-hmm. for the holiday. We had a very good night, the night uh. before Thanksgiving. Art fair. Art Fair Friday, I loved Art Fair Friday because all kinds of people came back to town you hadn't seen in years. Mm. The ones that had moved to Detroit or whatever, and the atmosphere, it was so electric. Uh, Halloween was another great night. Oh. Halloween, gay, gay people gay in Christmas. the cosmos, oh, costumes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the one where the, the, the uh, contestant dressed up uh, as a Christmas tree with all the Christmas lights, and she <laughs> got up on roller skates. She roller skated across the stage and didn't know how to stop and roller skated <laughs> off the other side. Yeah. What's this? <laughs> Y'all were putting thing. on roller skates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you, you, you may not remember the, uh, the TV commercials for uh, senior citizens with the, the thing you wear around your neck, so if you fall. Life you, alert. Yeah, life alert. Mm-hmm. So somebody dressed up as a really old woman and tottered on the stage. <laughs> and then she kind of fake collapsed and she went, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> she won the prize. Yep, yep. <laughs> and here we have, this is a, a week's schedule, Sunday to Sunday, uh, or s- perhaps this is S for Saturday, or Sunday, boys' yeah. nights out. Yeah. Uh, Monday industrial nights, which that, is to this day. Yeah, it is still to this day. It's Monday night has always been alternative industrial night. Always. We in college we used to say, well, we don't got to go to gay night. We can just go to industrial night. Which was half gay. Yeah. Anyway, I'm like, w- this is just as zesty as mm-hmm. gay night. Yeah. Um, and then I see at the bottom here, safe sex carnival proceeds go to Midwest AIDS prevention here on Valley Wellness. Yes, there were there were a lot of fundraisers at that time. Uh, carnivals and you know we'd sponsor uh, condom giveaways the uh, health department people would come in give away condoms uh, talk to people uh, that was that was the times what was it like being in the clubs as AIDS is wreaking HIV AIDS has is wreaking havoc across the country here uh, didn't really see much of an effect I don't mm-hmm. think there was the whole Initially, oh, that's just in the big cities. That's in New York and L.A. and San Francisco. But then so- somehow people started getting sick here, and people realized, oh, wait, the students are here, and they go back home, and then they to these big cities, and then they come back, and then they bring the, the virus with them. And so things started getting, you know, people got getting a lot more careful and, you know, all that. But people still love to dance. Of course. Like, you know, it makes you think of something that you had said earlier in this in this conversation, when it, it was uh, these spaces were people's place. Mm-hmm. This is where I go for friends, family, I'm not lovers. Gonna, I'm not going to give this up because of this. Yep. And I, I think we saw some of that in COVID too. Yes. So. Wow. Yeah. And then last but not least, and you were telling me, tell me about what this is. Yeah, I, uh, he's holding a uh, eight and a half by eleven piece of paper in plastic. You must be twenty one to enter the flame bar. 
You must show valid proof of age every time you order an alcoholic beverage. Yeah, right. Every time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. What is it? What right, so. <laughs> and then in the back, and this is signed by Harry. Yeah. No, that that's a different guy. Different Harry. Yeah. No, that's a Harry that was a, he might have been a Harry. Harry men everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was a photographer that went around town and he had models that would take off their clothes and be, to have their picture taken like in the Arboretum or, you know, in various well-known places around town. And he took these, uh, picture of these two naked guys walking past the flame at night so it was a postcard you used to be able to buy all his postcards at like m when middle earth was over there uh yes. selling their stuff uh, you could get all that stuff my first college job was at the village apothecary oh yeah so you remember across yep. the street yeah yeah um and then th this postcard with the naked gentleman outside of flame bar is that right by kilwins no kilwins is across the street okay uh, that used to be a restaurant called the Fresh Cream Cafe. Ha ha. <laughs> oh, it's a twofer. Yeah, it's a twofer. Uh, so, and the flame, is it still Logan? It was a restaurant called Logan that was nice and bright. And I'm like, boy, this is the cleanest this building's been in about 50 years. Yeah, turn the lights off. Yeah. Logan. I'm not familiar with Logan. Yeah. It then might have changed. Oh, and the flame. At the tables there, the booths, they had old booths, like restaurant-style booths. Each booth had a jukebox that was linked up to the master jukebox. Uh, and you could page through the, the pages of songs and put your quarters in and play your tunes. Okay, that has nothing. Like, touch tunes doesn't have nothing on that. Uh, touch okay. tunes. I would. So did you just put, like, in a quarter where you're sitting? Yeah, where you're sitting at the table, you put the quarter in, and somehow it was linked to that main jukebox. That's too cool. Now I got to put somebody's credit card on my app so I oh, can God. play my little song. I got to wait for 20 other songs. I can't even imagine having to do that. Yep, oh, know. my God. Well, the, the Touch Tunes machine doesn't even have a, a slot for quarters. One day I brought, mm. I had a whole bunch of quarters <laughs> sitting around, and I said, okay, we're going to the bar, and I got this, I got this bag. We're, we'll mm. listen to 100 songs. Mm -hmm. But they didn't even have a slot to put the quarters in. I was like, man. Times changed. Times, times changed. Are, times have changed. Oh. Oh, yeah, one thing that just crossed my mind is that people would say, oh, my God, it must be so wonderful to be the DJ at the club, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And there's a backstory. There's always a downside to everything. You know, and it's, you know I, I remember I was responsible. The, the owner did not want to be a, a promoter. Mm -hmm. He said, hey, Roger, you do it. You, you, you know, we'll give you so much money. We'll give you some of the door. We'll do the, do, you do it. So I said, okay. So I brought in Sylvester for his second appearance. And I, I didn't see the concert because mm -hmm. I was on my hands and knees in the coat check booth counting the money from the, from the drawer to see if we had enough money to pay Sylvester. Mm -hmm. Whoa. You know, there was uh, another person I brought in whose name was Claudia Berry. She mm -hmm. was a disco diva. She had transitioned into the 80s. Mm -hmm. She had hit out. Uh, she was so drunk. She couldn't remember the words to her song. No. And she just stood on the stage kind of blah 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 and lifting her skirt over her head repeatedly <laughs> and she l left the stage and never came back out to do anything else i put uh, my money up for that show and i was not happy yeah and i went back to where the dressing room was in the back there and the, the guy that we, we had there stan the mad hatter if anybody remembers him had to restrain me from beating the crap out of no <laughs> no <laughs> you know and then I put on another show that a singer from Detroit who had a hit. It was January and it snowed so hard that nobody came and I lost money. I said, okay, my, my period as a concert promoter is over. Yeah. Well, you, you had your hand yeah. in so many different cookie jars. I still do. Yeah. That, <laughs> you, you know tell idea. me about that. You have no idea. <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, huh, what do I do? Okay. I have my book about ships. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is my passion. Um, right now, I've got a couple of younger people that I'm training to carry it into the future, cool. which is super fun. Um, so with my interest in boats, I am on the uh, board of directors of the Marine Historical Society of Detroit. I've been, wow. on, I've been president for 20 years. Oh, uh, my God. Because of my newspaper background on the newsletter and the calendar editor, I do mm -hmm. anything that has anything to do with our publications. We're, uh, I'm finishing up the design on a 300-page hardcover book to mark our anniversary. Uh, what, oh, there's a, a website called BoatNerd.com, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm a volunteer with them. I work on their news page. <sighs> I'm a, uh, <laughs> up in Sault Ste. Marie. I'm a board member of the Sioux Locks Visitor Center Association, which is the place 
with all the displays mm -hmm. and stuff. So I do their newsletter, uh, and you know I work with them on all sorts of various projects that we do. And I love giving back to a place that meant so much to me my whole life, Sault Ste. Yes. Marie the Sulox. That's really nice. Uh, plus, I've met a lot of people through that group up there. Uh, so there's there's that, and I don't know. I just I just seem to be busy all the time. What a, uh, busyness can be such a gift. Well, I don't don't know what I'd do if I wasn't. Sure. You know, people say you, sh you should slow down. You got to get rid of something. What? Don't know how. I love it all. Yep. What am I going to do? Um, <laughs> so you're in Ann Arbor during the winter months, and then in yeah. the summer months, you're uh, uh, up, up north, in, up into St. Marie. Yes. Uh, that, that I'm sure it's. I can only imagine how beautiful it is to be up there. I'm I'm on the river. Uh, the sun comes up right into my front room. Oh my gosh! The freighters go right by out in front. Uh, I have trees. I have beautiful stars. It's quiet. You know, I, I bring people up to visit me from downstate. We get out of the car, and I say, just a sec, listen, listen to that. I don't hear anything. Precisely. Yeah. You know. You think you've been, you, night could be dark, mm -hmm. but if you've never been to the UP, oh, yeah. it's a darkness, like, um, in the, in the uh, stars are so bright in such an incredible way. It's... I keep running out. I hear it's supposed to be a Northern Lights night. I run out. I never see yeah. the darn things. But, <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I actually, I take that back. I did see them once, and they were pretty incredible. Wow. And uh, this past summer, we had one of those super moons. Yes, indeed. And I was watering my plants. I, I got into gardening in the last couple of years. I was watering. I saw what was happening out front. All of a sudden, there was a freighter coming from upriver and a freighter coming from downriver, and they were going to meet out in front in front of the super moon. So I drop wow. the garden hose. Yes. And I go get in my boat. Now, oh, by the way, my lights are broken. This so, is dangerous. <laughs> so I'm going, well, nobody will see me is yeah. the problem. So I'm going out in the river like a crazy man chasing the, the moon that's going between these freighters. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I just, you know, it's nuts. But, you know, the fog and the boat whistles and the hearing the, all the insects and the chirping and uh, it just peace and quiet and the sun sets and the sun rises and you know i i would say well gosh we don't have sunsets like this in ann arbor well yeah we we do there's just buildings yes you, building, you don't see it <laughs> and just there's something also just at least for me but just being by water it, yeah it's a very peaceful thing for me i grew up on the water and it's it's the place that makes me feel the best you know i i can remember in 1980 i'd be up north you know, for a weekend, and I would love it up there, but I would always, I can't wait to get back to Ann Arbor to get to the club. i got to yes. get back by 9 o'clock so I can get to the club. And now I'm like, the club? <laughs> I was going to say, What's a you, club? <laughs> have you been to the club lately, whether that's Necto or yes. whatever it might be? Yes, I was actually at the Necto uh, about six months ago, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the current owner of the club, I hired as a bar back in 1990-something. Wow. You know, I, I, I basically said, you're here so much, you ought to get a job here. Yeah. And he said, oh, I'd like to work here. So so he was a bar back, and he's, you know, risen up to be, be the owner. And uh, he said, you got to come in and check the club. I got, you got to see what's, what, what we did. So you know, a group of us did, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a couple of bartenders. We, we went in. I outlasted everybody else. I was there till 1130. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I know there's so but, many obvious answers, but what has changed the most? Uh, the phones. Yeah. Yeah. And the technology. I mean, I, you know, I'm in, up in the DJ booth, and, you know, my, my expertise stopped with CDs. And now the DJ comes into the club with his laptop and, you know, uh, does it that way, and I have no idea really how any of that works. Mm -hmm. um, so the technology has gotten a lot snazzier, you know, and if you're willing to spend the money, the light show has gotten a lot better. Yes. Uh, it's spectacular. Um, but, I, well, I kind of thought that maybe people dressed a little sluttier. Mm -hmm. But then I thought back. And I said, no, no, they've always dressed kind of slutty <laughs> in, this, in this bar. <laughs> That's a roll of the dice situation. Maybe not different eras. Yeah. You know, you probably get some racier outfits on other nights yeah. than others. But, you know, the thing is, I love the music. I, one yes. of my DJ friends who lives in Texas now, uh, but he did live in Ann Arbor, and he he DJed the Red Room DJ Mark. Mm -hmm. Did you Mark, or, uh, Mark Mark Johnson? Sure. Uh, okay, he's a great friend of mine. He does a Twitch program every Friday night, mm -hmm. and I I'm religious on tuning into that. Yeah. I just you know I can have the club on Friday night without going out to it. Indeed. And he stops at midnight my time, and by the way, I still love club music and hearing what's new. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you loving nowadays? Oh, I teach to do a Lipa. 
Lizzo. Uh, oh God, uh, I, I can't even think of some of the ones. Dua Lipa's like. got a good disco thing going. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so I belong to a gym up in Sault Ste. Marie. It's at the college. We have a college there, mm-hmm. and I, I go up there four or five times a week and, and walk the track and stuff. And it's like if these kids knew what was in my headphones, yeah, <laughs> they'd be like, "What is that old man listening to?" <laughs> <laughs> what would surprise us the most? Uh, rap songs. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, like songs like like Lizzo and some of those people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, oh, gosh. So you're not seeing me pull out my Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> no, go for it. But, but no, I, I, I've got a you know a good playlist going on here on Spotify. Here, uh, uh, I call it Jim. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, naturally. So here we're seeing. So I'm so happy to see the Pet Shop Boys and Erasure yes. are still cranking out amazing yep. music. Um, so here's David Guetta. Uh, here is th- Jack Jones. Jack Jones. Yes, yes, yes. Here is Lizzo. Lizzo. Lizzo again. Fits in the tantrums. What Republic called by Todd Hall. Yes. Oh um, God, he's taken over the world. Jake Shears. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Ultra Nate is still around Lady Gaga. She's got an Ollie Alexander. Mm-hmm. So cute. Um, <laughs> so the killers that are in here is more Dave Guetta, Dua Lipa, Talia. Oh, that's old. Um, um, I was Ali Alexander. Are you familiar with Eurovision? Yeah, yeah, that is. Yeah, yeah, him. Yeah, he. I was like, oh my god, the skinniest person I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, indeed. You know, but, but then we here we have Debbie Harry. I love Debbie Harry. <sighs> I'd listen to Debbie Harry recite the phone book if I possibly could. <laughs> uh, that's oh. got to be somewhere. <laughs> oh, oh, Troy Sivan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Armin Van Buren. There's him. Taylor Swift, of course. Oh. Got to have that. Uh, 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 saturated. You know, Sam Smith. Oh, yes. my God. Oh, God, you know that song, Unholy? That's so yes. so sassy yes. and so explicit. Yes. I'm in the supermarket in Sault Ste. Marie, and it's playing <laughs> on the music in the store. I'm like, what the hell? Yes. <laughs> Is anybody pre-checking this music? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, oh. thank you um, so much for being here with us and, and for sharing this with us and just being willing to have this conversation. Mm. Uh, it has been such a treat. Well, thank, thank you for asking me, you know, not everybody in the world gets to be a club DJ. Sure. Not everybody in the world gets to be a newspaper reporter, especially covering, covering arts and entertainment. Yes. Not everybody in the world gets to have their own book. I am the luckiest person. I wouldn't change a single thing. Well, maybe one or two. Of but, course. But everything worked out the way it's supposed to be. And I, I'm so happy I had the opportunity to be the DJ. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'd, I'd go back and do it in a heartbeat if I could stay awake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you're a lucky person, but also you followed your passions and you made it happen. Well, you know, and the other thing is I swore years ago that I was not going to be that old guy mm-hmm. that said they haven't made any good music since sure. and insert the year they graduated from high school. Not going to be that guy. Yep. I want. I still want to hear everything that, that, that I can possibly hear and listen to it. Being the arts and entertainment editor, I had to expose myself to a wide range of music, even though it wasn't my kind of music. Mm-hmm. I mean, I grew up on Mitch Miller, for God's sake. Yeah. So follow the bouncing ball, uh, <laughs> which uh, l- just just look it up, kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all need to sit down and watch some Lawrence Welk. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted, oh, I interviewed Lawrence Welk. <gasps> Not Lawrence Welk. Oh. Because he was gone. But, yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> his, his piano player was coming to Ann Arbor as a woman. Mm-hmm. Can't think of her name. I can see her in my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> was, I know her. And it was a hilarious interview, and I wrote it that way. <laughs> that was fun. Oh, uh, my stomach dropped when you said I've, I met Lawrence Welk. I was like, <gasps> oh, no, no. He was, he was gone. But. Yeah. Um, well... I, it's been such a wonderful uh, treat to to get to know you and, and to to revisit these club times, and mm-hmm. I'm uh, newly inspired to visit them again. Please, yes. go, go go to Chicago, go to New York and, and San Francisco, and check those places. Okay, out. what are some of your favorite Chicago bars? Because I'm, I haven't been to Chicago in a million years. Yeah, well, but, it's, but yeah. Sidetracks is that still there? Sidetracks Side is still there. Sidetrack? Roscoe's is that still Roscoe's there? Roscoe's is okay, still there. That's good. All right, Charlie's. Okay, the Country Western Bar. Yep. Yep. Um, 
you name it. Yeah, there are a few that aren't there. Broadway Limited, that was 1979. That was You had to mm. go upstairs, and I was like in an old railroad car. You had to go through a box car to get into the bar. <sighs> oh, the Granville Anvil. Oh, <laughs> I don't know that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, the Granville Anvil. Anyways, I just want to say thank you again. And you're, it's, you're welcome. It's been such a treat. It, I've had so much fun. Have me back. Yeah, yeah I was going to say. I'm, I'm sure I can dredge up more stories. Hell, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. We are happy to announce that you can listen to this episode or any episode of The Gayest Generation on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or our website, aadl.org. For more podcasts like this, visit aadl.org slash podcasts. If somebody you know or maybe you would like to be a guest on our show, email thegayestgeneration at aadl.org.